Come on, let's sing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. Foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation. Born of his spirit. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I in my Savior so happy. Watching and waiting. Filled with this goodness, love. Come on, everybody, lift your voice. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. One more time. Oh, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Amen, amen. You may be seated for a second. First, give an honor to God, to Jesus the Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior, to the Holy Spirit, which is our seal and guarantee of the redemption of our mortal bodies. To my lovely wife, Rosalind. To all of our ministers and their spouse. To all of our deacons and their spouse. And I'm going to have to call this brother out specifically today. To Brother Madison. The best minister of music this side of heaven. Choir didn't just call out notes, y'all. They they sang. I praise God for that brother. Brother Steve Avery. Brother Barry Williams. Not Leroy, but Brother Leroy Jones. Don't call him Leroy, y'all. And if he could be here with us today, he would be. Brother Melvin Morris was in... Arizona to Dave, to our media ministry, to all the ushers on the floor, to all of the visitors in the house today, and to you, the royal family of God, known locally as the McKinney First Baptist Church. There is a word from the Lord again this morning. Turn with me to one of the five books of the Pentateuch, one of the first five books of Moses, Leviticus. Leviticus, chapter 16. Leviticus, chapter 16. We're going to begin with verse 1 for the purpose of the message, 1 through 4. But for homework, I want you to read the whole chapter. And there's some things I may reference to throughout the chapter, but verses 1 through 4 is what God is wanting me to say this morning. But all of what this, this segment of, uh, of scripture represents is included in the entire chapter. In chapter 16 of Leviticus, beginning with verse 1, and I will be reading to you from the New King James Translation. 
The word of God says, now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of, of a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his sash. And with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And we'll use for a subject for this morning. Are you covered by the blood? Are you covered by the blood? You may be seated. Mighty and everlasting God, we come to you this morning thanking you for what you have already done as you've allowed the songs of praise and worship to usher us into this hour. Now, Lord, I pray right now that you would anoint me in your presence. Saturate me in your spirit that I may speak with accuracy, clarity, depth, and truth and may proclaim nothing but what you gave. Father, I believe by faith based on your word that your word is not going to go forward without touching the exact one or ones that it is intended for because it never returns void. We love you, we thank you, and praise you in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ who I pray and I give thanks, asking that you would forgive me of everything I may have said, thought, or done contrary to your word. Amen. Ushers, you may be seated. Before God created the world, before God set the stars in place, before God breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of man, God knew mankind would sin. And since God is all knowing, before the foundation of the world, God had already created a foolproof plan prepared to solve man's sin problem. And it would ultimately be brought through the death and the atoning blood of Jesus the Christ on Calvary's cross. But around 1444 BC, that's before Christ, God's word gives us a foreshadow of what Jesus would do on Calvary's cross here in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 16 emphasizes the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man. We are introduced to something called the Day of Atonement. Also in, in Israel, this day is also known as Yom Kippur. It is one of the most solemn holy days in the life of the Israelites. It occurs only once a year whereby the high priest went into the most holy place to make atonement for the people's sins for the previous year, and then the people confessed their sins as a nation. The Hebrew word for atonement means to cover. An innocent animal was sacrificed, and his blood was used to cover the sins of the people. You see, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices could not actually remove sin. It could only cover them. The Day of Atonement 
was a foreshadow of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice on the cross that would give mankind the opportunity to not just have our sins covered, but to have our sins removed forever. Now this word sin literally means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. The word sin is becoming a taboo even in the church. And those who oppose the word of God as being the final authority, folk like the lesbian mayor of Houston this past week, who attempted to subpoena five Houston pastors to turn over all of their sermons and all of the materials that they've ever written that had to do with homosexuality. These groups who oppose the word of God are attempting to muzzle the church from calling sin things like homosexuality, same-sex marriage, or abortion. Society at large do not want these lifestyles or actions to be called sin because that would not be politically correct. But how can something be morally and biblically wrong, but yet at the same time, it be politically correct? There is a sinister undercurrent going on today. Whereby there is an attempt to redefine sin to be psychological maladjustment or some type of disease. And you see, if this is if it were to be true, then that would make sin not really your fault. Therefore, you are not responsible for your sins, nor its consequences, if that were to be true. And in America, we want to redefine and downgrade sin so that the spirituality in this country is Christian in name only, but not in practice. But let me assure you, based on the Bible, each one of us will have to give an account of our sins. And only those who are covered by the atoning blood of Jesus will be ushered into the presence of our Lord when we leave this earth. Church, I submit to you that we in America need to understand we are in deep need of spiritual cleansing. We need to realize our God is holy and we who profess to be Christians must live holy. So with the text and the Holy Spirit as my guide, I'd like to share with you two object lessons regarding the interrogative subject. Are you covered by the blood? Object lesson number one, there are consequences for ignoring God's way. Walk with me around the text again. Verse 1 again says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. The occasion of verse 1 derives from events that took place in Leviticus chapter 10. God is now instructing Moses to go instruct Aaron, the high priest, do not ceremonially approach God without preparation. In other words, don't come into God's presence cavalierly. Don't come into God's house only when you don't have nothing else better to do. Church, until we confess and repent of our sins, we are not fit to come into the presence of the Lord. God will not hear our prayers nor accept our worship if we have unrepentant sin in our heart. Now, I stated earlier that, that the occasion of what we just read in Leviticus chapter 16 verse 1 derives from Leviticus chapter 10. So let's turn there and, and validate that. In, if you would turn back just a few chapters, six chapters back to uh, Leviticus chapter 10, look real quickly with me at verse 1 and 2 as I read it. Then Nadab and Abihu, 
the sons of Aaron each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered, look at this, profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. In Leviticus chapter 10. First of all, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, were doing something they wanted to do. Something they desired to do, but they were not called to do it. They were the wrong people to be handling the incense and presenting it to the Lord. They were, in essence, running out of their lane. They were attempting to do something God reserved only for the high priest once a year based on Exodus chapter 30 and verse 10. Nadab and Abihu also used the wrong instruments. They used their own censers instead of the censer of the high priest sanctified by this special anointing oil. They acted during the wrong time. For it was only on the annual day of atonement that the high priest was permitted to take incense into the Holy of Holies. And even then, he had to submit to doing it God's way, not his way. You see, the church cannot operate on popular opinion, but rather biblical authority. By burning their own incense, Nadab and Abihu Use the wrong fire. Scripture calls it profane fire, strange fire. These brothers sought self glorification and not to glorify God. We must know God is just as concerned about our motive for doing ministry as what we're actually doing in ministry. With God, everything is always a matter of the heart. Now, it may seem to us in our day and age, God was just too hard on Nadab and Abihu. We may say, why not just warn him instead? But oftentimes, at the beginning of a new era in salvation history, the Lord brought immediate judgment in order to warn the people. The priestly ministry at the tabernacle was about to begin. And the Lord wanted to make sure that the other priests knew this is not how you approach me. You see, it was not enough for the priest then or the pastor today to merely teach the people the difference between holy and unholy living we must also practice it in our daily lives. Our walk has to match our talk. In Montgomery, Alabama this past week, in Shiloh Missionary Church in Montgomery, Alabama, there was a pastor there that they just had to get a court order to remove him from the church. The pastor at this church confessed to the fact that he committed adultery. Now that could be something that disqualify him always and forever, but that, that's, that's a sin God will forgive, so the church could forgive. But look at what he did in addition to that. He committed adultery with various members of the church in the church. He was a, he has AIDS now, but at that time, he was HIV positive. He knew he was HIV positive, and yet he still engaged in adulterous acts with various members in the church. When you see something like that, there is, n see what sin do, sin will make you go crazy. When you get to being engaged in sexual immorality, it doesn't do nothing but bring you down. Go read Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32, and you will see how sin, especially sexually immoral sin, how it just bring you down. The McKinney First Baptist Church, we're in the midst of completing 
our ministry servant leader elections this month. And I want to caution every last one who has been elected, everyone who will be elected, those called by God to teach and preach, those called to be deacon and trustee. If you are not striving to live a holy life, if your heart is not in serving God with gladness, then you need to step down right now. If you are trying to minister to God's people, but intentionally living in unrepentant sin, step down right now. Don't offer God profane or strange fire. Now hear this clearly. Clearly hear me. None of us are sinless. None of us can pick up a rock and throw it at another. We all have our struggles. We all have our signature sin. If being sinless was a requirement to serve and lead, then nobody could serve and lead. Nobody could teach. Nobody could preach. Nobody could pastor. Nobody could play musician, could play the music. But what I'm saying based on scripture is that you can't serve God and he accept you and your service if you are unwilling to repent and turn away from your sin. Your service will be rejected by God and it may come with chastisement. And don't think you're getting away with sin right now. Just because nobody else knows about it, that is discreet. I want to caution you to read Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23. That says, take note your sin. You have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Church holiness is not a pipe dream. In essence, holiness is knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and you're striving to imitate Jesus. But, but when you sin, not if you sin, but when you sin, you come running to the mercy seat. You come running to God in repentance, asking God to forgive you, to cleanse you, and to strengthen you so you can live for him. I'm praying after this sermon is shared that all of us will reevaluate how we come into this worship center. How we come into the worship experience. Reevaluate how we serve in ministry. Because God has standards. Verse 1 affirms Nadab and Abayu, their punishment for violating God's standards with death. But since we live in the age of grace, most often death is not the immediate result for offering profane fire unto God for our unholy living and actions. Now, we may not die physically, but if you keep on offering God unrepentant service, profane or strange fire, then God will allow your reputation to die. He'll allow your character to die. Your influence to die. You'll say something and folk won't even listen at nothing you got to say because your talk and your walk don't match up. Object lesson number two. Mercy suits our kings. Mercy suits our kings. I had to say it twice because I know I need it. Look with me at verse 2, a bit back in Leviticus chapter 16. Look at verse 2. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil. Before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. It's apparent, very apparent. That God is making a succinct point to Aaron that casual entry into the presence of God is undesirable. Yes, God wants us to come boldly to the throne of grace. But we boldly come because we know who God is. 
We know God is eager to forgive. He's eager to cleanse. He's eager to make us free from sinful practices so that we can worship him, so that we can serve him and pray to him. Notice in verse 2, I hope you highlight in your Bible because there's a phrase I want you to highlight. Notice in verse 2 when it says, tell Aaron your brother, here's the part to highlight, not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil. In other words, don't walk into the church house with a haughty, arrogant attitude. Don't show up just on the Sundays that you teach Sunday school. Don't show up just on the Sundays that you schedule to open up the building. Don't show up just on the Sundays that you sing in the choir, that you usher. That is your time to be in the media ministry. That is your time to preach. Don't walk into the church house consistently late. That's in the text, y'all. I'm not inventing in this. That's in the text. Don't walk into the church house consistently late because this is not pleasing to God. Now, God knows when there's an emergency. And when there's an emergency, guess what? He look at that and he know it's all right. But let me tell you something else God knows. God knows that you don't arrive at your scheduled meeting with your supervisor 15, 30, 45 minutes late. God knows you don't arrive at your fraternity and your sorority club meetings late. God knows you don't take your kids to their extracurricular activities late. God knows you don't, that you're not late for your salon or your barbershop appointments. And then some can cavalierly walk into God's house for ministry or to worship, not only late, but then want to engage in ministry disruptive, worship divisive conversations with us. Church, we better quit acting like that God ought to just be happy I showed up. We better realize that God take this a whole lot more serious than what we do. Because what we are saying to God, whether you are conscious of this or not, what you are saying is that my stuff, the stuff that I need to do with job and extracurricular, it takes precedence over the Lord. I thank God, Brother Madison, you gave us some hallelujah music earlier. Because I know this toe stomping text today. In our text, Aaron couldn't go into the Holy of Holies once a year to sacrifice for the people's sins. And this decision was not about human choice, but about divine appointment. And the appointed day was the 10th day of the month. The 10th day of the 7th month, rather, on the Jewish calendar. And that would correspond to either late September, early October on our calendar. October the 4th was the, was, was, was the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, for this year. So when the dab and Abayu went into the Holy of Holies, without being called to do it, they tried to worship God their way instead of the prescribed way. And this is still an area that the church today must be aware of. You see, Psalm 100 is the prescription to how we ought to come into the Lord's presence. We ought to make a joyful shout. Some of you have been as quiet as a church mouse all day amongst all of this awesome worship that has taken place. It says, serve the Lord with gladness. It says, come before his presence with singing. See, you may not want to come in the choir, but you can sing at your seat. And then we are the end of the gates with thanksgiving. Be mad if you go to work. Be mad uh, 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 when you got an uh, extra meeting. Don't be mad coming up in here. When you come up in here, you better realize 
that God Almighty could have took you out and you wouldn't have even been here. You could have been that car you saw on the side of the road. You could have been the one stricken with Ebola. You could have been the one. But for God. Don't walk up in here cavalierly without thanking the Lord. And then notice in verse 2 again the phrase that says appear in a cloud. This refers to God's chosen way to manifest himself for the purpose of atonement. This cloud was likely the smoke from the incense which the high priest burned on his annual trek into the Holy of Holies. Now, this cloud, it covered the mercy seat. In other words, God's saying, the reason that you can even come before me is that I give you this mercy seat. But for the mercy seat, you couldn't even come in my presence. See, when we know, see, you, you just got to know what you've done in your own life. But when you know that you have not walked the way you're supposed to all week long, talk the way you're supposed to all week long, you come up in here a little bit different. There's some reverence. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. Aaron had to spend hours preparing himself to meet God. But praise God in our day and age because of what Jesus did on the cross called Calvary, we are offered immediate and unlimited access to God through Jesus. But we must never forget God is still holy and we should not allow this privilege to cause us to approach him carelessly. Our easy access to God through Jesus the Christ does not eliminate our need to prepare our hearts and minds as we draw near to the Lord in prayer. You see, when you have your devotional prayer time, I'm talking about your set aside prayer time. Hopefully you have this. Your set aside prayer time of the of prayer in the word. We need to start off in prayer with adoration. We need to thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are. We need to see when you start reflecting on who God is, when you start reflecting that I'm about to pray to Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. When I recognize, even if I'm sick, I'm calling on Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. If I'm troubled, I call on the name of Jehovah Shalom. He'll give me some peace. If folk of my enemies against me, I'm calling on Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who fights my battle. If I'm in trouble and troubles all around me, I'm calling on Jehovah Shema, the Lord who will be there. I can't speak for you, but that calm my spirit. I realize I, little old me, I can call on the name of the one in charge of everything. So I can't just walk up in his presence and start acting like he my genie. God, I need you to give me this. God, I need you to give me that. Then after I'm in adoration, then I can't help but then confess because I know I should need me in his presence. Then I offer him thanksgiving. Then I start asking him about stuff that I need, even stuff I want. Because he said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. But before you get to them petitions and supplications, you make sure also rather that it's all right when you're in an emergency. Just go straight to God with what you need him to do right then and there. So in other words, you don't need no formalized prayer when you're in trouble. 
You get a note from the, from the secretary to say the boss want to see you in the office. You don't have time to get on your knees and say to the Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. No, you can't do nothing but say, Lord, I don't know what I'm about to go into, but I know you're with me. Yeah. Emergency prayers, you, you can walk into his presence like that. You know why? Because he already know who you are. See, you don't show up just when you need something. Yeah. Yeah. Now notice in verse 4, why the high priest's attire was different on the day of atonement versus other times that he ministered in the temple. Look with me at verse 4. It says, he shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his body in water and then put them on. Oh, Lord. Now, when Aaron spoke to the people, on God's behalf, he wore the high priestly garments. He had the priestly uh, hat, the special robe. He put on the, the effort, the ephod, that was made of linen with gold, blue, and purple in it. It was clasped together at the shoulders by two onyx stones. And on these onyx stones was, gray, was engraved the 12 tribes of Israel. So when Aaron spoke to the people, on God's behalf, he wore this elaborate robe. But when Aaron spoke to God for the people, he had to ceremonially clean himself and put on plain linen clothes. See, this was symbolic of humility. Aaron had to lay aside his title before the Lord. The high priest had to remember it is mercy that suits his case. It was, it was God who allowed him in the first place to even come into his presence and to appeal to God to cover the sins of the people and himself. So this was not a time nor a place to, to be or to look haughty. Matter of fact, Aaron even had a rope tied around his waist. He had bells on the tassels because when he went into the Holy of Holies to minister, if he didn't do it right, he dropped dead right there. And the reason they had the rope was to pull him up out of it. How would you like to be the next one in line if that happened? Oh, Lord. Too many, too far too many in the church have lost our awe and reverence of just who God is. When you know you've sinned and fallen short of the, God's glory, but yet through God's grace and mercy, he allows you to come into his presence. If you're humble and you're repentant, that's enough to make you want to shout. I would suspect that there are some in the church house today who may have during another time frame in their life consumed enough illegal drugs, drank enough alcohol, attempted and committed enough daredevil acts to be dead or in jail. But for the grace of God and the mercy of God. Oh, I know y'all just a little too holy up in here for me. So, you know, I know it's about, it's about 20 of us in here who know that if, if everybody would know stuff we did back in our 20s, 30s, and 40s, if you knew what I did, you might get up out of here and walk up out of here. But for the grace and the mercy of God, his blood covers me. It don't just cover me, it removes them sins. And now I don't go back to what I was doing. I'm moving forward to what he's called me to do. There's about 20 of us in here. There's all that's willing to say, yeah, Lord. That was one time me. The songwriter got it right when he said, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Now because God has redeemed us, He's forgiven us, He's cleansed us, God has covered us, and now He has allowed us. Now we're godly mothers, godly fathers. God has redeemed us and allowed us to teach Sunday morning Bible study, to preach, to serve and lead, to pastor. We have nothing to be arrogant about when we come into the house of the Lord. Thanksgiving and praise ought to flow off of our lips. So when you come into that God's house, we need to leave our secular titles out in the parking lot. Place your worldly authority on the sidelines. Because our title and our perceived status does not impress God. In God's house, the rule of order, the methodology of by which how we're going to do things at the McKinney First Baptist Church is based on the word of God. Jesus the Christ is the centerpiece. It's the cornerstone of all that we're going to do. You see, when it is all said and done, you know what? When I get to heaven, God isn't going to call me Pastor Rosenthal. He's not going to refer to you as deacon so-and-so. He ain't going to call you Dr. So-and-so. He ain't going to call you Vice President so-and-so. He's not going to call you President so-and-so. If you make it into heaven, all you really want to, should want to hear anyway is servant. Servant. My good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now come on up and I'll make you ruler over many things. So in our day and era, we no longer need to have a high priest to go to the Lord for us once a year. We don't need to go into a little booth and talk to another human being about our sins either. Because something happened, y'all, on an old rugged cross. On Skull Mountain, also called Calvary's Hill. Jesus died on the cross for all our sins. The past, the present, and the future. And the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, meaning we have individual and unlimited access to God through Jesus the Christ. Not once a year, but daily and forever. We just have to repent and confess our sins. Church, today we're in the midst of four blood moons. We're in the Shemitah or the sabbatical year. The year of what may be a great blessing if the nation comes in repentance or based on the word of God, it will be a great shaking or collapse. The year could be a blessing or it could be great issues. We are having significant threat with ISIS. A possible Ebola pandemic can cause anyone to have fears. But if you're covered by the blood of Jesus the Christ, Jesus' is atoning blood will soothe your doubts and calm your fears. Today God wants to forgive you. He wants to save you. He wants to empower you. He wants to give you your assignment. But you've got to be covered by the atoning blood of Jesus to do this. Don't allow your past to rob you of your future. Because the atoning blood of Jesus, it reaches from the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. I'm so glad it flowed to the lowest valley because that where it found me. The blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never, ever, never, ever, never, ever lose its power. Are you covered by the blood? Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Father, we come to you right now. Lord, I was watching one of the police shows this week. And when one of the police went into a crime scene, there's this special device 
that they went around the room and it could pick up even the most minute blood on the crime scene. And it reminded me of what you gave me to talk to your people about today. Are we covered? Would, would, when you come, if you put a spiritual blood detector in this place today, who would be lit up with the blood? Lord, nobody but you know this. I don't. So therefore, Father, I say to you, if there be any in the house today not covered by the blood, I'm praying you minister to their heart, mind, and soul. That they realize it doesn't matter what they did yesterday, last night, 10 years from now, whenever. They can come right here, right now, surrender to you and be covered by the blood. They can be saved and made free. Touch one like that today, Lord. And or draw one who may have allowed their lifestyle to drift. But today, you're calling them back to committed service to you. If there be one in the house that need a church home. If this is the place, Lord, affirm it in their spirit. That when the doors of the church are open, that they'll come running. Saying, this is my assignment. And I'm ready to work for the Lord. It is in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ that I pray and give thanks. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Would all of our ministers, deacons, and faith counselors please join me? The doors of the church are open. Mm. Is there one in the house? that's ready to give their life to Christ? Is there one in the house ready to come and join? Hallelujah. Oh Lord, give the Lord a hand clap of praise when he worked like this. If you're in the house today and you want somebody to pray with you, about your signature sin, about something you may be struggling with, you're welcome to come also. Give, give me one second on this. When you go back and read Leviticus chapter 16, because I just believe you're going to do it, there's a, there's, a, there's a little part of this that I just can't help but mention. There was a thing in there called a scapegoat. What happened was the high priest had two rams in. One of them he slaughtered and used the blood to cleanse the, the, the holy of holies with it. But the other ram, the priest put his hands on it and he was praying, conferring all of the sins of Israel onto that, onto that goat. And they released that goat to go out into the wilderness. And that goat was called a scapegoat because that goat carried all the sins of the people. What that was was a foreshadow of what Jesus the Christ was going to do for us when he went on the cross. He was going to carry on the cross. He carried all of our sins. You don't have to walk around with guilt in your heart. You can confess it today and be made free. The doors of the church are still open. Is there another in the house for prayer? To give their life to Christ? Or if you're searching for a church home and you're ready to say, I'm tired of visiting, I'm ready to I'm ready to get my assignment so I can do what God is calling me to do. Because it's getting late in the evening. The sun is going down. But yet the, all the people of God are not saved. One more time, one more time.